have no idea to this day what those two Italian ladies were singing about. Truth is, I don't want to know. Some things are best left unsaid. I like to think they were singing about something so beautiful it can't be expressed in words and makes your heart ache because of it. I tell you, those voices soared higher and farther than anybody in a great place dares to dream. It was like some beautiful bird flapped into our drab little cage and made those walls dissolve away. And for the briefest of moments, every last man at Shawshank felt free. Open the door. Open it up! The frame, open this door! Turn that off! I am warning you, Dufresne, turn that off! Two weeks in the hole for that little stunt. On your feet. Freedom, even in prison. Mm. The prayers, Paul and Silas, didn't just give the prisoners a brief moment of freedom. Paul and Silas, they set all the prisoners free. Let's talk about it. Last week, we left Paul and Silas praying and singing praises to God while in prison. They had nothing material-wise, but God was powerful in their worship of him. God heard Paul and Silas' prayers of thanksgiving and petitions. Yes, it was a close relationship with God that day in prison that shook the earth. Boy, when's the last time you've had your earth shaken by God? It was so powerful that the prison doors opened. And that's kind of what old Red was talking about here in the little clip. You don't know who those two women were that were singing Mozart, but anyhow, they all said they felt a freedom that they'd never felt before, even in the prison walls. And what did he say? It was like a bird that flew in and just dissolved the prison walls. It lifted them out. It lifted them up. Did you know God can do that to us? The presence of the Holy Spirit and the power of God can lift us out of any prison-like circumstance that we're ever in and just set us free. My goodness, I thought that was good. And I can understand a little bit about what Paul and Silas was going through. Okay? All they'd done was cast a evil spirit out of a woman and uh, the people that were making money off of them nearly killed them. Yeah. Happens today. Uh, the shackles and their stocks, they were even released. They could walk, get up, walk around. And even the guard that was about to take his life because he thought everybody had got out of jail, got out of prison, had been released, and they were all free, and they were running amok in the town. He thought, I might as well kill myself because the law is that they'll kill me if I let them go free. But Paul and Silas stopped him. I've been listening to uh, a lot of the different preachers this morning and last night and 
I thought to myself, and y'all know I prepare everything on Tuesday, Tuesday and Wednesday. But anyhow, I thought, my goodness, we're, we have different messages, but we have the same theme. And that has to come from God. I don't, I don't, I've never seen that happen before like it is today. Let me tell you something, church. The Lord's fixing to come. And whether you're ready or not, I've done my best to get everybody ready. But whether you're ready or not, I'm going to leave without you if you're not ready. I'm going to go right on up and I'm not going to look back. I'm heading off to be with the Lord for eternity. Not a thousand, not a million, not a billion, not a trillion years, forever. Paul and Silas, poor, immaterial things. Anybody here? Anybody here rich? I mean, just rich? Let's start out. You got a million dollars that you just got in savings somewhere and you're just drawing interest off of it? Hmm? Living mansions? Yeah. But Paul and Silas were not rich materialistic wise, but how rich were they spiritually with God? Sometimes I think worldly goods can make us poor spiritually with God. Yeah, remember the young rich ruler? So what must I do to be saved? Jesus said, sell all that you have and give all to the poor and come and follow me. No, you're not going to have a mansion to live in, but get rid of all of it and follow me because I am your eternity. But he wouldn't do it. So can riches get a hold on you and pull you down? Yes. Yes. Don't have to. Don't have to. I knew a preacher that was a millionaire. He, he went right on preaching and proclaiming the gospel and helping the poor and everything else. He even had an airplane. He went to Africa and preached to the, in the revivals down there and preached to the Africans of people. You're talking about poor. They didn't have nothing. Just shanties to live in. But anyhow, he preached to them and he said, I had an interpreter with me. And he said he would tell them everything that he was saying in their language. And he said people were in the treetops all around him. Everywhere they clumped trees to hear. And said there was just thousands and thousands of them. And he said when the invitation was given, thousands of them came to Jesus Christ. And said then I had to come back to a small country church in the United States of America where I preached my heart out and didn't seem like anybody was listening. I said, Octo, I know the feeling. I don't know what it is. I don't know whether we're just used to it. We're just sensitized to it. I don't understand what it is that the gospel and the word of God can be preached today and it just seems like it's falling on deaf ears everywhere. But there's some people listening. I'm seeing some movement going on by God in the country today. I think some of them's listening. But it can pull you down. Riches, materialistic things can pull you down. I seem to be closer to God when just my needs are met. Now try to figure that out. Hmm? I owned a place in Dexter. Most of you know where it's at. I, I paid $150,000 for it. Beautiful place. The other day, it sold for almost $400,000. I wonder how those kind of extravagant worldly goods, if I still had it today, I wonder how it would influence me with God today. I wonder how much more patience that I would have with preaching God's word, serving God, you know, and thinking, well, God, they're just not listening. So nobody's listening, you know, and everybody's putting their things before you. 
So it's about time for me to put my things before everybody else. See, yeah, it has that pull on you. It has that tug on you. You actually have thoughts run through your mind once in a while. Why am I wasting my time? I'll tell you why. Because I'm on my way to heaven. And it's going to be, oh, oh, listen, listen to me. I'll just throw this in for nothing. I'll just throw this in. There's being a mansion built for me in heaven now. There's not a mansion on the face of the earth that it can, can even come near or close to that mansion. There's nothing materialistic on this earth that can even come close. It's not even worth mentioning compared to heaven. Uh. I'm fixing to move into, good Lord willing, a mobile home that through Ron and the Lord, I'm bringing up here. Oh, it costs a lot of money though, church. It cost this preacher a lot of money for that. Yeah, it's not brand new. What do you call it? Skylights and stuff in it, all that. Good home. It'll keep me warm in the winter and cool in the summer. Keep me out of the rain. But look what God, look what God has done. God has done all this. God has put it all together. <laughs> oh my God, I can't already wait. God made it all possible. He's led us in this direction and all these events and everything has led us here and this is going to come to pass. And I'm excited about it and I'm waiting to see what God's going to do because God put it together. It's him. So there's something afoot here. You know, God's got some plans going on here that I don't have a clue about. All I do is follow. You let it out, Lord, I'll follow you. You, you put the road out there, I'm going to go down it. It can affect us and influence us spiritually. Paul and Silas. In their weakest and worst moments, turn to God. In their weakest and worst, you ever had a weak moment? You ever had a bad moment? You ever had a tragedy to come your way? A disaster that you just didn't know how in the world you were ever going to bear up against it? Well, just keep living. You'll find it. Because it'll hit you. So they had a bad moment. But... Their faithfulness to God. Their prayers. Oh, they're singing like these two Italian ladies in the middle of Shawshank prison. We're singing their hearts out. And everybody stopped what they were doing. And for a moment felt freedom. That's not going to be but a moment before long it's going to be for eternity can y'all imagine that can you imagine the glory that's waiting it's worth it whatever you got to go through it's worth it ah. from inside a prison cell freedom they found by knowing God their prayers and praise didn't just free them. <laughs> Church, somehow today we've got to get a hold of this. Yes, God has set us free. Yes, we understand being liberated from a sinful life. Yes, we understand it took the death of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary and his shedding his blood and he's shedding his life to set us free. Yes, it cost all of that. But it didn't just free us that understand it today. It's meant to free the whole world if they'll just listen. And it's meant that the church 
would perform some kind of a sacrifice to try to witness to others that they may be free too, like we are free. There's a freedom thing going on. Oh, don't get me on that freedom thing, United States of America. Mercy. We're about to lose ours because we're keeping our mouths shut. It's worth the sacrifice that you and I will have to make to keep our freedom. And who's to say that if God leads you to speak to somebody, to witness to somebody, to sing at a time you don't even realize what you're singing for, or to pray at a time you don't even realize what you're praying for, that it's for someone else. It didn't just free them. It broke open the doors and loosed the shackles of all the prisoners. So when you get all the people that understand what freedom is, when you get all the people that has a relationship with God Almighty, when you get them all together and they begin to sing and they begin to pray and they begin to witness, you see multitudes led to Jesus. Ah, if only the churches could wake up. If only they could wake up. Around the world, the doors would open, the shackles would be loosed, and all the prisoners would go free. But that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning. A freedom tsunami was being unleashed (laughs) in that prison. Paul and Silas was just a little bitty beginning. Two men. In Acts 16, 27, we read that the jailer, he woke up, assuming that the prisoners would all have escaped. He pulled out his sword and he began to to kill himself, commit suicide, because he knew he was dead anyhow. Because he did not know what Paul and Silas were singing and praying about. (sighs) Drew his sword. He would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had fled. But Paul stopped him. Paul and Silas had stayed behind thinking God had a greater plan to use their suffering for. To many other people Faith in Jesus Christ was important for getting worldly ambitions and seeking God's ambitions. Oh, what would happen if we would just try that? Hmm? Get our minds on God. Huh? (laughs) You know what? It may be that the United States of America is going through a rough time right now. And I don't guess it's rough if you can pay $5 a gallon for gas. Huh? Is it affecting anybody yet? Everybody's still going to work, right? We still going to work? Yeah, $5 a gallon. Uh Uh-huh. You won't eat that steak every night. Because guess what it went to? It's about $10 a steak now. So, we're back to hot dogs and bologna, aren't we? Crackers. I remember eating crackers and bologna when I was growing up. Thought I didn't know any better. At least I thought it was the way it was. I thought everybody was eating crackers and bologna when I grew up. Now we had chickens. Yep. I fed those chickens. I gathered eggs from those chickens. I fought those chicken snakes right and left every time I reached my hand in a nest. Feel something slithering instead of an egg. Chicken snakes, they ain't, they ain't, they're not that bad. You know, they bite you and you just sling them off. But those water moxins, ooh. Those water moxins like those chicken eggs too. So you had to make sure whether it was a chicken snake or a water moxin. Because that, that rascal bites you, you're in trouble. But anyhow... We had chickens, we had eggs, we had fried chicken. You know, we had pigs. Man, I fed those old pigs. 
You know, you had to catch them off in the pile of water. That way, we had a little pond, and they'd go down there and water in it on the side in the mud and everything. I'd catch them down there, and then I'd sneak that feed out of the stall and sneak up to their trough, and I'd start pouring. Did you know they could hear that feed going in that trough from that pond and stampede toward me? And boy, I just threw it and ran. Sometimes just throw the whole bucket and run. I'll tell you what, they'd chew your leg off. They got close enough, so you had to do it that way. Big old sows, 300-pound sows, man. they just rolled me over like I was nothing. I was a kid, but we had that. And then on top of the chickens and the eggs and the pork, we had beef. We raised cows. Oh, for those days again, I thought we were poor, but we were rich, you know. Oh, my goodness. We had all we wanted to eat. And when we had a hog killing, you ever hear that? Hog killing. All the neighbors come over and help you kill, a, kill the hogs. We'd kill two or three of them, you know, and then they'd, we'd have to keep some of them Give some of them away, you know. But anyhow, that was some good days. Then the jailer overwhelmed by their faith and their sacrifice. Now, what did I say again? Does that bear repeating? Huh? The jailer's fixing to have a change of heart, but what caused it? What causes people to have a change of heart? The jailer was overwhelmed by Paul and Silas' faith and their sacrifice. That's the key. The Christian sacrifice. That's the key. If we're not doing any sacrificing, if we're not inviting anybody or witnessing to anybody, or if we're not trying to, our best to live some kind of a representative life that Jesus Christ wants us to represent in front of all of our family and all of our neighbors, if we're not trying to do that, the key is that you're probably not going to win the jailer. Let alone your family. So the jailer asked Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? I see something that is different about you. Oh, that the church, just all the churches in Scott City, Missouri, Oh, that we would just be like Paul and Silas and represent Jesus Christ in such a way and sacrifice like Jesus did and like his, the followers of Jesus did. If we could just do that, the next thing you know, you would see a revival spring out in Scott City, Missouri. And people would be saying, I want some of that. That's the real thing. I don't want people that are living convenient lives. I don't want people that are doing like I'm doing. I'm trying to get ahead every, every direction I turn in because I want this and I want that. Uh, bigger houses and bigger houses and bigger houses, if you ever notice, and then bigger cars and bigger trucks. I want bigger ones and I want better ones. And you know, and uh, forget you people that are dying and going to hell because it's mine. I want it. I want more. Huh? You, you mean? No. No, Brother Larry. It ain't me. It's my wife that wants that. Or the wife might say, no, Brother Larry. It's my husband that wants that. He wants the big gun. He wants the big boat. He wants the hunting and, and fishing kind of thing when he gets off from work. Forget going and witnessing to somebody about Jesus Christ. And then most of them today, forget going to church. It's fishing time. They're jumping out of the boat, They're jumping in the boat. You see, you see what sacrifice means? Until we come to the knowledge of that, Jesus Christ is going to come and he's going to have to leave a whole bunch of people behind because we have not, we've not understood what he's doing. So 
so what must I do to be saved? Paul and Silas told him, you need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, where did he hear that at? Where did Paul and Silas hear that at? Where did he get that truth from? He'd been with Jesus. They'd been with Jesus. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Now I'm going to tell you all something. I'm going to tell you something if you say, well, all you got to do is just believe in Jesus Christ and you're on your way to heaven. We'll go back to everything we were doing before. We'll live just like we did before. I got some news for you. The devils in hell, according to the word of God, believe in Jesus Christ. So there's more to it than believing in Jesus Christ. You're not going to be saved just by saying, I believe Jesus Christ lived. Forget it. Oh, well, I didn't know that, Brother Larry. You mean the Bible says... The devils in hell believe in Jesus Christ? Yes. But they're not going to follow him. They're not going to live a life like he lived. They're not going to listen to him. But they believe he's here. Why? Because he was always fighting them and defeating them everywhere he went. He was always casting the demons out of people. He was always bringing people back to life that had been dead. They knew him. But they didn't know him. You understand? So what's it going to take? What's it going to take? If all this, we, we understand about all this, what's it going to take for us to believe? You're going to have to believe and you're going to have to F-O-L-L-O-W. Okay? You're going to have to do a little praying, a little singing, a little sacrificing yourself. If you don't do it, <laughs> you're going to wake up someday at the judgment seat of Christ. Maybe you made it that far, but you're going to lose all your rewards. <laughs> and don't blame nobody but you. And you know what most will do? Just like all the demons in hell, they're going to wake up at the great white throne judgment. Huh? What do you mean? Two judgments? Yes. Yes. You're going to wake up at the great white throne judgment. And he's going to point his finger at you. And he say, your name's not in the Lamb's book of life. And he's going to point his finger at you. And he says, the angels are going to come and gather you. And they're going to bind you up. And they're going to throw you into the everlasting lake of fire. For a hundred years. Don't you know more about the Bible than to agree with me with a hundred years? No. Thousand years? No. Million years? No. Trillion years? No. Quadrillion billion years? No. Ever and ever and ever, the Bible says. That's when this old boy woke up. When that preacher told me that it was for eternity, I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm smarter than that. And I was getting ready to go until a bunch of them classmates around me, I thought, oop, what will they say about me? I'm not a perfect angel, but, you know, if I go up there, what are they going to say about me? They would say, there goes a hypocrite. I know old Larry Rouse. He's not no angel. So I just sat there and bent the back of the pew, you know, Wood. I don't know how much I bent, but I sat there and grappled with it. And I left that night grieving. I had nothing on my mind that I made a mistake, that I should have accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior that very night. I should have done whatever was necessary for me to get my name in the Lamb's Book of Life and have my way headed for the Heaven one day, I should have done it. 
but I didn't. So I went home and I sat up most of the night and I was praying and I was saying, God, if you, I was ignorant. I was just ignorant. All I had to do prevent all that praying and all that feeling uh, scared that I could die and I would end up in that lake of fire. I was scared. All I had to do, crawl over to the side of my bed and ask God to forgive me right then or even before I left church that night and I would have been saved. But I, here's what I prayed. If you'll just give me till tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. I don't even, I can't even remember going to school. I can't even remember riding the bus. I can't even remember going to the class. I can't even remember what the teachers taught that day. The only thing was on my mind was time. I was waiting until church time in that revival the next night. Wednesday night, I was just waiting. Everything was just a blur. I had one thing on my mind. Boy, was I, was I zoned in. Yes, I was. I was zeroed in on going to church that night and keeping my promise if God kept his promise. If he didn't take my life that day, then he would give me my life that night. And I'm telling you, you know what? It was agonizing to sit in that pew. Oh, was all the classmates there? Oh yeah, plus some more. The devil stacked the odds against me. Yeah, he said, well, I'm gonna win again tonight. And boy, what he didn't know was I wasn't gonna spend another night like that one. He didn't know that. I had my mind made up. No, he didn't know that. He thought he could do anything. He thought he could take me and just wring me out like a wet shirt towel he thought he could do whatever he wanted to do with me and I would fall hook line and sinker for all his tricks knew he didn't know there was a power of the Holy Spirit that was drawing me like nothing ever before in my life I waited for the first song I waited for the second song I waited for the third song I thought, are they having preaching or are they having a singing convention? I mean, I'm sitting back there waiting and waiting and I'm saying, My, I could die any minute and go to hell and you people are singing. Let's get, the, let's get to the word. Let's get to the invitation. I couldn't wait for the invitation. And I mean, when they said the invitation, I'll never forget the evangelist stood behind the pulpit. I never heard a word he said. And, I, and the, the, the pastor of the church, he was down here by the altar. Never heard a word he said. Never hardly heard any of the singing. I had one thing on my mind, and the gates of hell was not going to stop me. Now that's conviction. And when the preacher got done preaching and the pastor stood down there by the altar and they started singing that first course of that invitational number, I was right over here about where Kenny was. And guess what? I rose up out of my seat, stood up. All my classmates was looking at me. What's Larry doing? What's Larry doing? What's going on with Larry? You know, he stood up. I stood up and I said, Move your feet back. I'm coming out. And I came out of that pew. And I got out in that aisle. And I walked down to that altar. And the preacher was sitting there waiting on me. Grabbed me by the hand. Can, what can I do for you, Larry? I said, I'm being saved. The minute I left that pew, I was saved but didn't know it. The minute you make up your mind that all of hell and all the chains and all the barriers cannot stop you, you're saved. You're going to do it no matter what. You're saved. God knows then that you mean business. That's what it's going to take. You have to convince God that you mean business. He knows. I don't know, but he knows. I think there was about 16 of us went down to old Black River that next weekend out there in that old muddy, swift Black River. 
man, if you walked out too far, you were gone. So they, they had them all, they had all the men lined up, keep us from being swept down the, down the river, you know. There, a lot of people had a baptizing place out there. You had to be careful. If you walked back too far, you dropped 10 feet. And then the current grabbed you. And you were gone. So you, even in being baptized, even in reflecting that what had happened to me, being baptiz baptism is uh, uh, showing people something that has already taken place in your life. You've already accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's a confession to all the people. Oh. Then I went into that water already saved. I came out of that water even better because I was beginning my testimony to the world that I had accepted Jesus Christ and that he spared me that one more day from going to hell on eternity. Hope, oh, I start to say, I hope you don't have an experience like that, but I do hope you have an experience like that. Change my mind. I hope you do. I hope the Holy Spirit and the word of God and the a picture of hell in your mind will be so, so vivid that you will have to give in. You have to give in. And the church needs to be right there for you when you give in. And they were. I mean, they were. They were the best bunch of people. Just like our church here. They would do anything for you. There's a bunch of them. Man, when I was, a, I was young. Kids, I was young. They, they, I mean, right off, the, they, they would, we had big old bean trucks. And they'd put tarps over the backs of them. And they'd put cots in the back of them. And we'd go off to Table Rock Lake. And we'd go off to Wapapella Lake. And we'd go all those places and there'd be people take us and, and we would just have the best times. They believed in working with the young people. Those days can still happen. Big farmers, yep. Oh. They taught him about Jesus Christ and the life of Jesus Christ. The grateful jailer took them in to his house. <laughs> it changes people, don't it? It changes them. He washed and bandaged Paul and Silas's wounds. <laughs> and the final verse in our Bible story for today reads, Acts 16, 34. And when he had brought them into his house, talking about the jailer, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. His whole house was saved. When's the last time you've seen that? His whole house was saved. He and his whole household came to faith in Jesus Christ and they were set free by an example of two men who had nothing. They had nothing. Paul and Silas, they had Jesus. That was enough. That's enough. I don't care what you think you gotta have. All you gotta have is Jesus. Hey, I'm living proof of it. All you gotta have is him. And everything will just fall in place. It'll just fall in place. Uh, do you know anybody that needs to be saved by your example? Whoa, let me say that again. Do you know anybody that could need to be led to the Lord by your example? What kind of example are you setting? Huh? Are you sold out and committed to Jesus Christ irregardless of the beatings you're going to have to take? Huh? Are you? Well, it may take it. I hope it don't. But it may take it. It's my hope and prayer that we all remember these lessons and these stories about others who put their faith and their trust during their weakest and most troubling times and moments. During these times, they continue to put their faith and trust in God. I pray we'll be able to praise God. 
not to receive anything from God, but simply because you understand that your life and hope are found only in Jesus Christ. One of the best feelings is to look back on how God brought you through and suddenly you're confident he's going to do it again. Now I've got a poem I want to leave you with. Y'all pay attention to this. I was going through some troublesome times. And I read, a, I've got a couple of devotions that I read. And I read this one. Let's read it together. Title Only Loan. God didn't say that I might keep this lovely autumn day, nor did he mean that through all time, this world would look this way. It's talking about fall. He sent the beauty of the fall, the changing autumn leaves. Changing is a key word. And yet I know within my heart, God only loaned me these things. <laughs> I want you to do the best you can while they're carrying you down the street or in the hearst to the cemetery. Do the best you can to hold on to what you accumulated. See if you can take it with you. I marveled at the reds and the golds, the mountains smiling fair and filled my mind with wondrous sights I found most everywhere. So much in beauty to behold October's pleasantries and yet so soon will change. I know God only loaned me these. God only lends life's lovely things, however large or small. He keeps them ever in his power, then, lean, then lends a share to all. Old Mother Nature's golden days, the mountains, plains, and trees, the joys and gladness they impart, God only lends us these. <laughs> so, Larry, what are you saying? I don't care what kind of house you live in. I don't care what kind of vehicle you drive. I don't care what kind of cabin you got on the lake. <laughs> I don't care what you have. When you draw your last breath, it's gone. It belongs to somebody else. Well, you say, well, I'll leave it to my kids. They'll enjoy it. Well, that's all right, but you're not going to have a, a leaf on it. What you've done in life and what you chose in life will determine where you spend eternity. Now, don't get me wrong. Those things are good. I love those things just like anybody else does. But I'm going to tell you, which side of the bread that I have butter on? You ever heard that old saying? The side of bread that I have butter on, the best side of the bread is I have Jesus Christ. Nobody can take that away from me. Nobody. I don't know whether it's all the experiences that I've went through in life or what. But nobody can take that away from me. I can give it away. But nobody can take it away from me. Everything that Sharon and I'll have, and the kids, where's the kid? Kids, might as well understand. It's only loaned. It's only loaned. Bow your heads with me. Father, thank you so much for the day that you've blessed us with. Thank you for the lesson that we've had this day. Help us to remember it. Not only this Sunday, last Sunday, God, Paul and Silas and all the things that sometime we as followers of Jesus Christ must endure. Help us to be better servants, better followers. Help us to have our faith in you. Magnified God to the point that others may see Jesus Christ in us. Forgive us where we fail you. Forgive us where we misrepresent you, Lord. And God, just continue to guide and direct us by your word and by your Holy Spirit and by the people around us, God. And Father, save our families. 
May all their names be recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life before it's too late. Save all of our friends and neighbors and co-workers, God, before it's too late. Help us to be one of your instruments, God. I know you have many around the world, but help us to be one of your instruments. Help this church, God, be one of your instruments too, Father. Continue to guide and direct us and teach us, Lord, what it is that you'd have us to do, what it is that we're missing out on, because there's no greater joy, God, that I know the angels enjoy than seeing someone give their life to Jesus Christ. There's no greater joy for a Christian than to see someone give their life to Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the day, the ministry, and the blessing continue to be with all. It's on our prayer list, Lord. But don't let us forget, God. Save us in Jesus' name we ask. Amen and amen.